and gentlemen, welcome to this evening's video cast of Beers and Bites, brought to you by your co host Chris Jordan of Fluency and Jeremy Murdershaw of Fortify. Tonight's special guest is W. Curtis Preston, who is the chief technology and evangelist, if you will, for a company called Druva. Uh, now, he's a definite industry expert in backup recovery written about four different books, does a lot of different podcasts and things. So I think we're going to have some pretty exciting discussions this evening. So just hold on. But first, as always, we got to go around the horn and talk about the beers that we brought. And we'll start with Chris, please. All right. I'm going to go with the uh, New Belgium um, a Future Hop. I just got it because the can looked pretty good. It's an <laughs> 8.5. That's how I often pick things. And then I still had one I found in the back of the refridge, uh, some liquid escape. It's a good summer beer, so I'm going to find out how it tastes like four months later. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, All right. what about yours? So I'm going to start light. I got this new uh, Belgian white called Dayfall from one of my favorite California breweries called Stone. Yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, kind of a light wheat ale. So I'm going to, you know, really kick it in with an 11% dragon's milk. <laughs> I love this stuff. It's awesome. All right, and All right Mr. Let's talk about your Alaskan IPA. Yeah. No, no, guys. This evening, I have a Texas brew from one of the oldest craft breweries in Texas, St. Arnold's. And this evening, it is a juicy IPA uh, from St. Arnold's at a 7.1%. Uh, I guess it's got a lot of citrus or tropical and citrus taste to it as well. We'll find out. So with that, uh, Curtis, please, what'd you bring? Well, Curtis... Uh has uh, a, a I'm going to see if I can put it in the camera. Can you see Belgian triple threat? That was mm -hmm. what I called this beer when I made it. I don't know, like a year ago. It is a, um, you know, it's a triple Bel Belgian style triple. I think when I measured it, it came out at about nine and a half. So uh, a couple of these and I should be feeling pretty good. Excellent. <laughs> put, put all the hard questions up in the front. There you go. <laughs> uh, well, cheers, boys. Cheers. Cheers. So Curtis, uh, you, again, you've got a long storied history uh, uh, going way back into the 90s with backup recovery and and obviously a very, very critical part of today's uh, business models, especially because of ransomware, right? So if you're not fully backed up and have the ability to do a full recovery, it, it's going to impact or even shut down your business for some some period of time. So give us a little back, a uh, bit of background and history, how you got started and and a little bit more about the backup recovery, please. Well, two people loved each other and oh, okay, not that far. Um, so I got in, <laughs> I ended up in the backup business because the, I wanted a job in computers. I, I was getting out of the Navy and I, you know, I, my wife worked at a bank, which was called MBNA. I don't know if anybody remembers that bank. It was a, at the time it was the second largest credit card company. And I saw these big buildings with these big computers, and I, I just wanted to be there. And the backups was the job that I could get, right? That, that, that's that's how I think everybody gets the job in backups, is it's the job nobody else wanted. And I ended up there for a few years and then went into consulting. And when I went into consulting, my goal was to get out of backups. And except that I ended up getting put at the headquarters of Amico, another company that's uh, no longer called what it was called. And their backups were broken. And long story short, next thing you know, I'm writing articles, I'm writing books. And, you know, so I started BackupCentral.com. And I've been, you know, I've been blogging since 99. And uh, started the podcast, which is um, Backup Central's Restore It All podcast and um the um we even have a theme song it's um it's ba it's a parody of adele's rolling in the deep you know the you know the chorus where it says you could have had it all ours is you could restore it all it's a very angry young lady that lost all her data <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and about four years ago i joined druva which is a SaaS based data protection system so instead of having to configure and design and install and maintain and secure an on-prem uh, or cloud-based backup system, you just use a service, 
right? And all you have to do is put in the appropriate authentication or, or agent somewhere, and then we do everything else. So, so, so looking back to, to my background, but when I was working at IBM in the mainframe market, right, there was, when we talked backups, right, you'd, you'd go multiple levels, you'd, you'd go to tape, and then the tape would be taken off and put in storage, right, and you'd rotate tapes and, and things like that. But you also had this notion of point in time recovery, right, yep. how, talk a little bit about that historically, and then where that is today, if you would, please. Well, when I came in the industry uh, in 93, it, all backups were tape, right? And when I, but the, you know, the amazing thing is that when I joined, you know, just for, you know, for, for the youngins in the crowd, the, the here I was at a, a company that was a $35 billion company. And if you added up all the disk drives in that data center, they would fit on this. Right, we had we had a 300 gigabyte data center, and everything was taped. So we had eight millimeters, and we had uh, we actually I actually started with nine track tapes. You know the old you know the old mm -hmm. IBM style, the big old things, um, 120 bits per inch, great great tapes. And then what happened over time? A lot of people think that we moved off of tape because tape is too slow. It actually the opposite is what happened. So tape the tape they wanted to fit more and more into the same space and when you put the bits closer together on tape and the tape stays the same speed the tape gets faster so what happened is the tapes actually got faster and faster and faster and the tapes were so fast that the backups couldn't keep up and so they became fundamentally incompatible with the thing that they were originally designed for and so we started doing all sorts of acrobatics to, 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 to address that. Like we, we did this concept of disk staging where you'd put a little bit on disk and then you'd copy it over to tape. Or you do this thing called multiplexing where you'd put a bunch of backups together into one stream and that would make the tape drive happy. But it made the, work, the, the restores worse because you had to restore the whole thing and throw away most of it. And so we slowly over the last two decades came into the idea of using disk as your primary protection mechanism. And then of course, um, you know, 10 or so years ago, we started looking at doing uh, the cloud. And I know when Druva started the idea of a SaaS based data protection company, I think 11 years ago now, uh, back then they were kind of crazy. They were the, you know, out in left field folks. But now everybody's trying to do what we're doing. All of the mainstream data protection products, both the old ones and the newer ones, they're all trying to develop a SaaS based um, version of their tool. So. Uh, and but in terms of to just a quick answer to your question, you do have to have that point in time recovery. It's just now we we don't do that with tape rotation and you know and handing those tapes to a man in a van. Now we do it with object storage in the cloud and automatic replication to multiple locations. And you, you the big thing um, I'm going to cut my answer short, but uh, there are shorter. <laughs> um, at some point, we need to talk about the air gap. And that was one thing that we actually lost when we moved from tape to disk. Agreed. So when we look at today's environment where these ransomware gangs, criminals, nefarious states are coming in, right? Part of what they're doing to folks who aren't necessarily prepared for it is not only are they taking out their active data, but they're going after their backup data as well. Absolutely. So how how are how is the uh, security mechanism today protecting from that capability uh, from the ransomware folks? Yeah, that 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 really is a real problem because I remember when the the idea of ransomware was first sort of presented to me. It was back about 2014. I remember seeing. The idea of ransomware and i think it was actually in 2015 when my dad's business partner got attacked by ransomware and they wanted 400 dollars or something and i remember thinking well people have backups what what's the problem i don't understand why anybody's paying the ransom if companies have backups and what has happened is the ransomware um has th there were two problems one is people did have backups but they didn't have a good dr plan so while they had copies and they had the ability to restore their data center, their, their RTO, the recovery time objective was measured in weeks. And so they, they, they would, they would um, say, well, do we want to, uh, do we want to spend 
two to three weeks and hopefully recover our data? Or do we want to pay this ransom and maybe get it back in a, in a day or two? Um, and so that, that was that. But then what started to happen is the ransomware products, not only uh, are they targeting the backups, they're either um, they're scrambling the backups or in some cases like the Conti ransomware group, they go in and the first thing they do is exfiltrate all the backups and then they delete them. And then, and then they do the attack, <laughs> right? And they're like, we have all your backups. Uh, so don't even, don't even try. Right. It's like, you know, um, and, and so, it, you know, it is a real problem. In fact, if you read the average ransomware article, you'll look, just look for one little phrase and you'll see like, and the backups were encrypted or the backups were also attacked. You see that phrase in so many of these articles. That's right. And so, and the reason for that is the fact that we moved from tape to disc and the backups are sitting there on the disc and, and quite often in, in many modern day based backup systems, um, it's on a windows disc, right? So here the, the, the ransomware is attacking windows based systems, right? It's the primary, it's not the only, right? It, Linux is and VMware and products like that are not impervious, but the primary attack vector has been windows. Somebody gets a Windows laptop, it brings it into the data center, and then it spreads, and then it spreads to this Windows-based backup server. And then right behind that was Windows-based backup server is a file server with all the backups. So it's just, it's just an easy peasy. There is no air gap in a modern um, data protection system. And so there are a number of things that various companies have done to address that right um they include things like well first not being a windows based system that's very popular um using features in linux for example like the, the immutability feature in certain file systems and that will protect it from a direct ransomware attack if you get root it won't protect you it won't protect from that because all you have to do is unset the immutability flag and it goes away um and then what some of the, especially the Windows-based backup products, what they're doing is they've, they're, you, you, select, you select the data that you think is really important, and it does a copy of that data up to object storage in the cloud, and they turn on the object lock feature. And so your, your cloud provider won't even let you delete it, even if you're an authenticated user. And that's, that's about as safe as you could do with a traditional backup product. Um, the only way to attack that would be to compromise the account itself and actually delete the account, which has been, that has been done, right? Um, but it, it's pretty rare. And then finally, uh, there's what Druva does, which is you don't get any access to your data, uh, direct access, right? The data is stored in our account behind many, many layers of security. And the only way to get access to your data is via our protocol, via our user interface, right? And so it's air gapped, all backups are stored in a completely different geo, a completely different account, a completely different technology. Um, and so that, I, I think that's, I think you're gonna see that, uh, you know, more and more as, as people see their, their data becoming. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, so my final, you know, comment really, and I'll let uh, Chris and Jeremy jump in here, but it, People can't afford to be naive anymore about their cybersecurity, period. Uh, and they especially can't believe that just because I put it on a backup doesn't mean I'm gonna be able to get that back. Uh, there's gotta be a lot of intelligence around that. And it, it sounds like what Druva does is in fact, uh, one of the best practices out there today in terms of doing that. I'll, I'll tack one thing on the end, and that is, if you're really going to be successful in defending against a ransomware attack, um, you really, if you're reaching for the restore button and you're gonna do a, rest, a full restore of any kind, you know, pick, pick whatever technology, but if you have a blank slate and you're doing the restore after the ransomware attack, I think you're still gonna lose. The only way to truly be successful is to, and, and there are a number of tools to do this, uh, and Druva is one of them, where you are, you're essentially pre-restoring your data. You have a standby copy of your data ready to go. 
Uh, the cloud makes that incredibly affordable and, and incredibly possible. And then, and, and it's, it, it's affordable because you're only paying for the storage until you need the compute, right? And then you just turn the compute on. Uh, and so I, that's the other thing. So in, in, in addition to protecting your really important copy of your data, you need to essentially restore it in advance so that you can just essentially turn it on. So, so that would be equivalent maybe to the older mirroring capability? Well, it's, it's, it's mirroring with a delay. Got it. Right. <laughs> uh, mirroring and, and, and replication and direct. Re the problem with that is if you get corruption on the primary, it corrupts the, the secondary. This is still in a backup format. So there's a delay, right? And you're <laughs> at the end of each backup you can just specify that when the backup is done, update the, the mirrored copy. Got it. Right? Um, and it's just automated and all of that. Okay. Well, listen, I'm going to take a breath here and let uh, Chris and Jeremy <laughs> jump in with some questions. No, what you need to do is take some shots. <laughs> you open the beer, but you never drink it out. Come on. Well, I am. I, I, I got it in my, uh, my Papa glass. Uh, hey, the kids. Juicy. It's pretty clear. You sure there you got it is. beer in there? Nice. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's lemonade. He's trying to trick or apple juice. Trust me, it's tasting so pretty good. The obvious question. By the way, this this beer is limited edition because I actually have retired my beer making hobby in favor of my new woodworking hobby. So, you know, I saved the best for you guys. Nice. There you go. So the obvious questions. Data encryption. Encryption during backup, encryption at rest. Yes. Both of those boxes. But what encryption mechanism do you use or do you allow the user to specify? So um, great question. So first off, it's a giant yes. If you're going to be doing cloud-based backups, honestly, if you're going to be doing any base backups, uh, you should be doing encryption. Uh, we, we use, um, so first off, we do what's called, are you guys familiar with deduplication, the concept? Okay, so we do- but For our audience, why don't you- Well, yeah, a, so deduplication is the up. idea of looking in the backup image and getting rid of duplicate data. And the, there are two reasons for that. One is there, we charge you for the amount of storage that you take up in the back end. So it's a significant savings from a storage perspective. The other is it's, it's what makes internet-based backup feasible, right? The fact that I can, I can back up a laptop with a, you know, a, your home, whatever cable internet that you have is because it's essentially block level incremental backup forever. And if you've got a file on your laptop, that's the same as somebody's file on somebody else's laptop, the first person backs it up, nobody else backs it up again, because if we do global, that's called source side deduplication, meaning we identify the dupes at the very beginning of the, of the, of the process. Then once we've chopped all that data up into individual pieces and we've identified which pieces are new and unique, the we use uh, SSL during the uh, transmission, and then on the back end we use AES two fifty six, and the customer uh, gets a uh, a few choices, the in terms of what they want to use for key management. The um, but but what's most important is the only person with the key is the customer, even if we had you know whether it's a governmental entity or or uh, you know, some sort of uh, black hat that somehow got to the right person, even with ultimate power inside Druva, no one is able to read your data. So the customer has ultimate control over the key management. So have you developed your own data centers that you're storing? Your oh, you know what? I, how, you how did I never mention this? We run on AWS. Choice. Um, and so we are run you using in their KMS service. KMS, their KMS management? service is one of the choices that are that's made available. The um, we run in almost everywhere that AWS has a full suite of services because we are built. There's a lot of products that sort of run in AWS or Azure or GCP. We are designed specifically for the AWS infrastructure, so we're using. You know, we're using um, DynamoDB, we're using, um, you know, RDS, we're coding directly to their, their suite. Um, and so we need their full suite to be functional. So almost everywhere where they have a full suite, some examples, some obvious examples of where we don't is we don't run in China. 
um, due to political and security concerns. Um, but most everywhere else, and you get to pick which um, data center you want to target, right? So you could be, for example, in, in the in the wet in the U.S., you could target U.S. East if you're a if you're a Western company, and vice versa, et cetera. This makes me. You know, I want to pick on this a little bit. Um, so GovCloud, do you support GovCloud customers? We we do we do support GovCloud as well. We're we are, um, and this is not my area. But we are, um, what's the, um, darn it, the, this is what happens when you start drinking beer and you're talking technology. What's the, what's the certification? We are, we, we do run on GovCloud. There is the FedRAMP. 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 Thank you. FedRAMP certified. We're also FedRAMP certified as well. Thank you. And you have your ILs, like your IL four and five. And and now and now we've reached the end of my level of knowledge of, of our level of certification <laughs> in the. Uh... Okay, that's good. That's fine. Good answer. Good answer. So you, you um, how did you come on? How did you get named the moniker, Mister Backup? Uh, that's a great question, and the honest answer is I don't remember if it, it just sort of started happening, and I remember that when. Once I once it started happening, I definitely got a hold of it, and I said, "Okay, well, you know, I'm going to SEO this, and you know, I'm going to use all my marketing skills, and and I'm going to do that." But I I honestly don't remember the original. Uh, but I, you know, I'm one of a very few people who, if you want to find a cybersecurity person, easy peasy. There are thousands of cybersecurity people. If you want to find somebody who has specialized and backup and recovery their entire career, there's like three of us, right? So <laughs> one of us uh, got the name Mr. Backup, another one, um, uh, Mr. Chapa, he, he went with Mr. Recovery, uh, you know, sort of a jab at me of like, you know, it's only about the recovery. I'm like, yeah, whatever, whatever, Dave. Um, it's a good guy. You can't recover unless you have a backup. So yeah, well, I well, I you know, I I, I make a similar joke about grandkids and and recoveries that, that I I'm thinking about just skipping straight to to grandkids, right? Because they're way more fun. Same thing, you know, just forgetting about the backups and skipping straight to recovery. It's not really possible, but you know, nice idea. And the third one's named WAP. Is there what? <laughs> <laughs> what's the third one called <laughs> you know i well i i literally actually um the the, the one that's come to mind is backup dave backup and dave. he's over at um he's over at veeam and uh good good friends with him he was at gartner for a long time and um yeah so he's called backup dave hence hence, hence there's oh. no backup conference so yeah, three yeah, of them. yeah, there's yeah. no, yeah, there's no, there, there were three, storage conferences four back in the day, but there was no, there was no, but I remember when I, I remember when I, when I was at my first job and I made, I basically made it, they, we were doing the business cards and I, I put the, the title backup administrator on the, on my business card at MBNA and my boss looked at it because it was like a fake title. My boss looked at it. She's like, what are you the administrator that they call when the real administrator isn't available <laughs> I was like, no that's not it's not what i was going for there but so so to go back to like um because we we kicked off almost right off the bat with ransomware right yeah obviously that's not why we created backup in the first place right we we used to have redundancy you brought up disaster recovery you know dual backup system so so wait right now what is the what are the innovations in backup and are they all around ransomware is that like you guys go around saying ransomware is the best thing that ever happened because now people talk about us i'm recognized well um you know <laughs> ransomware uh, so I, I i i i don't want to be there there was actually a a podcast that i did where i spoke to there was a one of the influencers that i work with uh, Chris Evans, a really smart guy in in England, and he had put together a blog where he had sort of suggested that um, darn it, it was not Chris Evans. Sorry, it was a different. I don't want to. I don't want to accuse Chris. So one of our influencers came up with Captain America. Uh, no, 
no, not not that Chris <laughs> Evans. Um, but he, uh, this was actually a, another guy from um, from Gestalt IT, and he had sort of suggested that all of the backup vendors had just rebranded their products as ransomware products, and there wasn't any real invention. We were just ambulance chasers, and I took quite offense to that. Um, one is it's like, well, it is a new problem, and we need to help people understand that there is a solution to this problem and we, we do happen to have the solution. So yes, there's been a lot of, you know, opportunism, if I could, you know, say that word, but there's also been a lot of innovation around specifically around ransomware. But I'd say the innovation in the last several years has been, um, first off, it's been either just making backups just way easier than they used to be. For many, many years, backups were one Band-Aid after another, right? We got dis we got disk caching and that was a Band-Aid. We got, then we got target deduplication systems like data domain, which is, you know, I'm not dissing the product, but it was essentially a Band-Aid. It allowed you to continue doing what you were doing, but use disk, but in a more afford affordable way. Um, and, then the other innovations that have happened over the last 20 years have been to address new problems, right? So VMware uh, and Hyper-V and KVM, these were all new problems because basically VMware came out and it broke backups overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing, the, 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 the latest thing that broke backups is um, Kubernetes and Docker, right? It, it broke it way more than, than VMware did. And before that, there was the cloud, because up until just a few years ago, we had a data center, right? And we call it the data center because it was the center of data, and now it's no longer the center of data. Your data is everywhere. And the backup systems have had to play catch up to the fact that your backups are now, or your, your data is now in Microsoft 365 and Salesforce and G Suite. And it's in AWS, it's in, it's in Azure, and it's in, and, and you have all these backup systems that for many, many years, all they had to worry about was a data center. So most of the innovation, I'd say over the last, um, you know, 10, 15 years has been catch up to, to address new problems. But there's also, I know in the case, you know, I'll, I'll speak for Druva, we innovated in a way where what we did was we made a SaaS based backup system possible, right? Cause I, we're not the first. Uh, in fact, I remember when I was interviewing for the company and I, and I talked to one of our really sharp SEs and I said, why will we succeed in this industry where so many other companies have failed? And the answer was that we had figured out the cogs, right? The, the cost of goods sold we were leveraging the cloud the way it's meant to be leveraged, which I would argue that the way to use the cloud is bursting, right? And the way to use, the, another way to use the cloud is to pay for things as you use them, right? Lifting and shifting into the cloud is not using the cloud. It's just, you're just renting data center space. But if you have an app that just makes a database update, you know, once a minute. Well, you don't necessarily need a database. You need a database service that charges you for each update. And so we just completely went, you know, from scratch to design a system that leverages uh, the way the cloud works. And so that, that was our innovation. And um, just to give you one example, so it, it both, we both, leverage the cloud from a cost perspective and also leverage the cloud from a technology perspective. So a perfect example is DynamoDB, which is a giant, essentially infinitely scalable key value pair database. One of the things we use it for is that dedupe uh, database. Every other dedupe product in the world has a dedupe table and it hits some number. You know, you, you have hundred terabytes and you have to stop and you have to go make another box because the dedupe table can't keep up with all the lookups. We use DynamoDB. We have customers that are double digits of petabytes, all deduping data all together with no performance problems, right? So th those are the kind of innovations that we did, but we'll continue to see, I, I think you'll see a lot of innovations around uh, Kubernetes uh, containers and things like that. And 
and also backing up SaaS apps. So, so it's interesting. So what you're saying, because you're getting Kubernetes, you're saying that your backups need backups. The cloud needs a backup itself. The cloud absolutely needs a backup. And, and, and by the way, that's I spend half my time explaining that. You right? just throw it in Glacier? What's that? What about Glacier? I mean, you just don't throw it in Glacier? Well, the thing Turn is- Turn on the mutable well, the, in S3. Well, the point is you need to put it somewhere, yeah. right? And, um, and, and you should be putting it somewhere other than where your, um, where your primary copy is, right? So nothing wrong with using Glacier. The question is, how do you get it to Glacier? And more importantly, how do you get it back, right? Glacier is really bad at restore speed, right? You don't want to use Glacier for day-to-day -day operational recovery. But Plus that's where the expense is recovering it from Glacier. Exactly. Because, the time right? and money because you got to move the, the movement of Glacier is much more expensive than the move right. Of so right. you you we got we got, I'm going to go back to the air gap. You need to make sure that if the primary thing is compromised, it doesn't compromise the backup. So just copying your backups into Glacier, if it's in the same account and if it's in the same region it's no good, right? A, per, a perfect example, uh, there was a company called Code Spaces. was, uh, ironically, it was a safe place to store your code. And they got hacked. And a um, they, the, the guy said, give me a million bucks or I delete your company. And they, you know, told him, you know what? And he deleted the company and they, they ceased to exist. And all their backups went right with it. You delete an AWS account and everything in that account is immediately Do you deleted. believe that to go over, do you, when you talk about a duplicate, are you talking about different zones or different regions? Uh, yes, right? So different regions, uh, definitely different zones, right? So you, you, you have to have different zones, but I would recommend different regions and, and most importantly, a different account. So, so right? would in different regions possibly cause privacy right issues, especially in GDPR, if you use a different region. So different regions within boundaries, political boundaries. Yeah. Different regions within, uh, within reason. Right. So if you're, if you're in a, if you're in a, um, a government where that's not possible, right. Then you do what you can, right. You get it to another availability zone. But again, I'm going to go most importantly, the backup company needs to be in another account, mm -hmm. right. Um, because yeah. if your primary account is compromised, your backup account wouldn't necessarily be compromised. And again, that's automatic if you use a service um, like ours. But if you're going to do it yourself, you need to do that. And it, and it is harder to do it yourself. The, the other, the part where I actually find myself arguing the most <clears throat> on whether or not this is even necessary is when we talk about something like Microsoft 365. They have protection mechanisms built into their system. But in the end, 365 from a customer spec perspective is really just a very fancy database with an application on top of it. And when you delete an email, you don't actually delete the email, you set the deletion flag in that record, the database record for that email. And um, if you use their retention policies to keep it for 90 days, then all you're doing is setting that retention flag for 90 days, you're not actually making a backup. And so if something catastrophic, or I would say when something catastrophic happens to your account, you will not be able to recover that data if you're using only 365 tools. And, but there are, there are people that do not agree with me. There are smart people that do not agree with me. Yeah, it sounds um, like you're talking like a, a professional backup guy, right? I mean, that's your objective, right? You want to make sure you get everything properly backed up. Yeah, I mean, it, it's what I do, right? Um, and the there are those who are sort of 365, it's specifically with Microsoft 365. I don't get this argument in Salesforce. I don't get this argument in G Suite. But 365 has so many good sort of what I would call convenience restore features that it mimics backup, but it is not a backup. And what I would tell to anybody who disagrees with me, please go look in your service agreement and look for words like backup, restore, recovery. They are not in there, right? Um, there is something my, called the shared responsibility. Uh, literature used to say that our applications cannot be used for critical use, which <laughs> anyways, yeah, what are you going to say? Jeremy? I mean, I think, as they, Curtis, you really hit it on the head there. It's the shared responsibility model of the cloud. Microsoft will 
guarantee deliverability of their mail. They will they will guarantee certain underlying functionalities, but if you're if you hose your mail system and you lose all your mail, they're not giving it back to you. Exactly. So at the end of the day, it's still the customer's responsibility to back up the mail and more importantly, to protect the mail. That's a different episode yep. on the future date. Yeah, that's a different it's a great episode to come up. We gotta find someone to do it. Because I mean that is, you know, one of the things you talk about. I mean, Curtis left field thing is like on the mail system, a lot of people use MX record guards or like MX firewalls to protect their mail. There's a lot of services around Microsoft that need to be built. It's, it, we're yeah. not there yet. I mean, there's a lot of things we should be seeing around the corner. Well, and, and you probably have the problem in the cyberspace that, um, or cybersecurity space that we have in backup space is a lot of people made the justification to buy 365 by saying, well, we don't have to do all these things anymore. <laughs> We used to have this, we used to have this firewall. We used to have this, you know, MX guard. We used to have backups. We don't have to have any of that. Microsoft solves all the problems. <laughs> and, you know, you know, it's a, it's an incredibly resilient piece of infrastructure, but it is not, you know, I, as long as computers are built, maintained by people, you know, even if they start being maintained by robots, if those robots are built by people, <laughs> right exactly mistakes happen so, so one of the things you brought yeah, up I mean, is office 365 really pushed the exchange admin role out right that there's it's very un unnecessary role to have organizationally anymore now you need a cloud admin an azure admin something like that yeah so those gcp admin and, and g suite admin it's less about managing the software mail system itself and more about managing the mail. Yeah, it, it's about, it'll be about permissions. It'll be about groups. It'll be about, you know, do we want to give one drive access to this group of people or this group of people? It's that type of stuff. It, it's actually probably closer to a cybersecurity type position. You know, you, you, identity. you, you get rid of all the identity infrastructure management. concerns, right? One thing I was wondering is you, you keep on going back to disk. Um, I live out in the Virginia area near Leesburg, which is just data center after data center. Yep. Obviously, tight tape is way more environmentally friendly. Um, what is the environmental impact of, of using S3 drive as your main means of backup as opposed to tape? I mean, yeah, are we yeah. sending a tremendous amount of electricity for data that might never, ever be used? Well, so there is, that's a great question. Uh, and, and I don't think I have a good answer. It's one of these, I would, I would start with saying, well, unfortunately tape no longer did the job. Okay. Um, th th we, we have to start there. Tape for most environments um, is simply incompatible with the, the thing for which it was originally designed. And, and that's a technical problem that just simply has no good solution. It's great for long-term archive, by the way, right? Um, and so really we had to use disk. So what you do is you just minimize the degree to which you're using disk. You use things like deduplication because you can do dedupe on disk versus tape. You can't really do dedupe on tape because if you need, if you did dedupe on tape, you would need 400 tapes to restore one file. That doesn't work, right? So we can do dedupe on disk and um, then the other thing is when you talked about files or blocks that may never be needed, you can migrate it out to lesser expensive tiers. You can even migrate it out to tape. There are cloud services that if you migrate to that level of service, you're actually migrated onto tape, right. but, it's S, but it's S3 protocol, so you can just put it and pull it as you, you know, as you need it. Um, so tape isn't, you know, tape isn't out of the, of the system by any means. In fact, I would argue, even though to my best information, Glacier is a purely disc based service, but they do things, for example, they also, uh, there's a concept called made massive array of idle discs where they're, what they're doing is they're spinning the disc down and they're spinning the discs up 
So Glacier, although it's a disk-based system, it's designed to kind of behave like tape where they're powering it down. Again, to save power, to mainly they're not doing it to be green. They're doing it to save money. Uh, but that's why um, that's why it takes three hours to get something back from Interesting. From Glacier. Is there, is there a degradation issue that you have with MADE? And, and the reason why I ask you that, if you're relying on a block that you stored and your dupe says, hey, that block already exists, I got a hash of it. And what happens if that gets corrupted because the data store itself is that dead, right? Yeah, it gets that, corrupted. You haven't done it for 10, 15 years. Listen, I've got tapes of that I made in the 80s. They don't sound so good anymore. When I put them <laughs> yeah, in my deck, yeah. they, it so, doesn't, uh, doesn't sound yeah. the same. I, I would say that you're comparing uh, analog tapes to digital tapes. But, okay. <laughs> um, so a little, little oranges and apples thing there. But there is an issue of bit rot. I actually speak about it quite a bit. Object storage addresses bit rot in that when you have object storage, which is S3, your uh, first off, it's automatically replicated to multiple locations. So if you do have bit rot, it's only going to be in one of the locations. And what happens is that it, uh, meaning like each individual incidence of bit rot is going to be in one place. Right. What you have is you have S3 has the ability to continually recalculate the hash which is used as a unique identifier for each object in there. And if bit rot happens, the hash changes, thus showing that corruption has happened silently. You can then repair the bit, rap auto, bit rot automatically by grabbing another object from somewhere else, from so, other from other. So roughly. forgive my ignorance here, but isn't that almost describing some of the RAID technology of years past? Great question. So RAID, RAID is... Redundant or array well, of inexpensive disks. Yeah, thank you. Um, the yeah, we 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 change but, there, but, it but there's levels of RAID which will do bit recovery too. Well, that they, they will, but mainly that that wasn't the main purpose of RAID. The main purpose of RAID was if a disk dies, you 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 can replace it, right? right. Um, I, I th th there there is this um the the bit uh darn it um he's talking about bit corruption is, is as you lose information on a disk it's not obvious to the system yeah it's not obvious to the system that it's happened right but with object storage it it is obvious to the system and the system can automatically repair it got it um, okay so he's, yeah. he's a crypto guy you, can, you gotta give, give him a little slack <laughs> <laughs> so so, so. Yeah, Jeremy, give a muffle. I was going to ask you one last thing, Chris, is, is that, so we see a lot of people using EBS because EBS is blazing fast. They put it in the drives, especially in our industry, they use it for log management, like with Elastic and stuff. But EBS only has three nines of, dur or sorry, yeah, three nines of durability. Mm -hmm. The S3 has 11 nines of durability. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend somebody, if they are doing log management, because most of the companies want to get speed. They go to the EBS. We don't. Where do we stay in S3? But do you, would you recommend that they, they create a trap door and just store directly to a backup system instead of gambling with the data being in their EBS before they transfer it over? Well, I, I have this crazy idea. Again, you know, Mr. Backup, right? I have this crazy idea that everything should have a backup, right? So if you've got data that has any kind of value to your company, then it should have a backup and and depending on right what your what your recovery point objective is right so that's the we we all sit down we sit in a big room and we decide what the what how much data we're allowed to lose and we say all right it's it's a, we can only lose one hour's worth of this data because an hour costs a million dollars so then we get a system that costs way less than a million dollars to to protect that so we all agree what the rpo is and then something less than the RPO, you should be frequently copying that data to some other system. In terms of using S3, th there are plenty of systems actually that use S3 as their primary protection mechanism. The only question I would have then is what is your backup of that, right? So S3 has has more resiliency, and not just S3, but object storage only, in general. And yeah, so in S3, I mean, in fact, Glacier and S3 had the same 11 nines of durability. So what, what, I mean, are you, are you dissing S3 or? You no, saying, no, no, no. I'm saying, I'm saying that 
that for example, just to give you an example, the, this, the, the customer code spaces. So somebody went in and deleted the data. That's logical corruption that S3 cannot protect from. If you okay. delete your object, so, S3 so, will say, so, so, thank so, you very so much. Purpose, purposely manipulating the... the I, right. I, so so I, I would want to know, if you're using S3 as your primary storage mechanism, my question is, what is your protection for that? Right? So um moving uh I, I would want you to have a backup of s3 and by the way backup of s3 was not something that was um on the forefront of the design you know the the list of stuff that they designed s3 for it's actually something yes. that's just now starting to come out mainly because people used s3 as the backup not the primary but i i think it's i think it's great and by the way s3 is faster than people give it credit for if you use it the way it's designed to use, for example, we get into, um, uh, you know, bake-offs where we're against an on-prem backup system and we often beat the restore speed of the backup system. And they're like, how do you do that with S3? Well, it's again, how we use it. We store an image of a server as tens of thousands of little tiny images. And then we can go to S3 and say, please give us these 10,000 uh, objects all at the same time, and it just fills the pipe. Yeah, but if you store it as one big blob, it's it's not going to be as fast as EBS. Yeah, you know, good code is really you're bringing up the issue of actually people know how to code. You know, less and less every day, thanks to Python. Yeah, yeah Jeremy, I'm I'm done. I'm just going to bitch now. <laughs> I was just going to say is. So one of the reasons why it makes S3 so fast for Druva is the time to first byte, milliseconds. Time to first byte from tape or some sort of on-prem restore capability is not milliseconds. It's right. minutes, tens of minutes potentially. If it's tape, it could be hours. Yeah. Yeah, but I think you know, as part of a strategy of backup, having an air gapped copy off site, whatever would make sense on a tape, right? Yeah. And, and again, I can't argue against the value of having that copy. The only thing I will argue is that it's really hard to make that copy. Right? You guys um, are military people. So you keep on using the air gap and all I can think about is the cipernet versus nippernet and air gapping it. But you're, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you're really not talking about a real air gap. You're just saying, some jackass has to load a tape in or a drum in and swap the damn well, thing out. The idea is that you need to separate the protection from the protected, right? And the reason why I've been screaming air, uh, air gap over the last few years is because as the backup industry migrated from tape to disc, we lost all air gap. But right? you kind of created, like, take Trubo, right? Because we do the same thing. And if you ask me about our database, I'd say it's immutable. And you're yep. doing it because of the APIs. So, mm -hmm. so what you're talking about is if I remove the function or remove the function so you cannot delete, you don't yep. really have to have great technology. If the only way to touch my system is through the APIs and there's right. no delete API, right? I'm pretty good. Yeah. I I you know, I'll 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 I don't I don't know your technology, but um, you don't have to, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the idea is just make sure you've got multiple levels of protection between the thing that you're protecting. Uh, and then also, the, 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 by the way, you brought up the immu immutability term. And it's a term that because of all the ransomware attacks, a lot of backup vendors are throwing that word around. And, uh, you know, I don't know if we have any Princess Bride fans there, but, you know, I, I, I want to say, I, I, you keep using that word. I, I don't think it means <laughs> it right? Um, because- Fantastic it, line. <laughs> yeah, and immutability and, and air gap, you know, how do you, you say you have an air gap, but you're a, an on-prem backup system and it's the only copy. It, 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 it's the complete opposite of what I would consider to be an air gap. Right. Yeah, I think you know, um, from a code perspective, we use immutability difference. So, so what we mean in immutability in the code is is that um, if I have to write something new, I use a new block. So I'm never overwriting what I had before. Right. right? That's and what then, immutability and that's, means in the code world. And that is a valid uh, that is a valid sort of way. But I would say in the data protection world, the immutable term means that it cannot be changed. Right. So, I mean, that's just literally what it means anywhere, right? But, but, so the question is, 
immutability isn't, we think of it like it's a binary condition. It's either immutable or, or not. Like it's pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not, right? It's I would not think that way. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm pretty sure- Unless you're an apple and you can be a guy that can be pregnant, but that's a completely yeah, different story. But, so, so no comment on that. But in the case of immutability, the question is, what are you immutable from? Meaning, so there are some products that are immutable, meaning they can't, the, the backups can't be changed, but only from say ransomware. So like you talked about the append only, their backup product with append only file systems. And that's great for ransomware purposes, but what about privilege, privilege okay. escalation? What about lost you know, passwords? Chris, that's a great you know, answer, right? The, right. What we're really talking about is the fact that backups were originally designed believing the system itself and the media itself would fail. Right. While what, when we deal with ransomware, we think that the media is not the failure. It's the system itself is the failure. Yeah. Yeah. And there are, there are a whole bunch of things that can affect your backups that aren't ransomware. Right. I mean, they do tend to be cyber related, right. They, they too tend to be somebody's compromised some credentials or, or they escalated you know, or logged for J. Is, or, Chris, is you that? talk about timeliness is the, is denial of service, right? So yep. when, when Amazon had that outage up in the in the nor Northeast, if you really needed that data, if you had a backup in a different region, you would have been a little bit, you know, better off. Yeah, well, that I mean, that is a that is an AWS concept is designed for failure, right? Um, well, you're supposed to be designed, designed, designed for, for that. What's that? The internet was designed for failure. But anyways. It was, <laughs> but not everybody uses that design, right? <laughs> sure, so nah. Not anymore. It's a myth. It's the lifeblood of our society. So myth, myth. they can't fail. Sorry, that All was right, a Muppet. So. That was a Muppet movie reference. I don't know if anybody got that. Oh, I missed it. I missed the Muppet movie reference. I got to go back to the tape. When you said that's a myth, and I said myth, myth. Listen, right. I, I heard All this right. thing on NPR the other day where, where people are now in the in the audio business going back to cassette tapes because there were some distinct, just like you know, they're going go back, back to the, the old analog. Movies, right? They're going, they're going back, back to analog. To analog. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I um back to I, the future. I have a, a someone that I know that is that is a really high up in the audio business and in the the Hollywood world. And he um yeah they he's he's time. still he's still all digital. He's good, but he but he boy does he he makes me look like an amateur when it comes to backup. I'll just say that because he doesn't want to lose his work. Unless you're unless you're George Lucas and you can't find the original Star Wars. Um, <laughs> that was a rough day, by the way. Well, I guess when you start flushing stuff down a toilet that has critical information on it, <clears throat> go there either. <laughs> so can't go to so the who, National who, Archives. Who <laughs> Come on, Duncan Dinuts. What do you want to know? <laughs> so who does who does Druva view as their nearest competitor? If if ignoring what Gartner yeah. Says and about this space, yeah. who does Druva view? Are so, you most afraid of Veeam, Enable, Acronis, Barracuda, Carbonite, Backblaze? Who is it? Yeah, so so that's so it, it's easier to say what's not a competitor. So when we look at so Backblaze is a strong company, you know, they IPO'd recently. They are not a competitor in that they don't go after the same space, right? They tend to be they're a what we would call a prosumer company. We tend to be a middle enterprise to enterprise company. So we don't, we don't run into back plays. Um, the, the other question is what do we consider? Um, we have competitors in each space that we play, right? So we do data center backup. We do endpoint backup. We do 365 backup. We do, um, you know, um, and, and cloud backup. We have competitors in each of those spaces. But in terms of companies that do, that, there isn't any company that does everything that we do. So it's um, when we look at the companies that are moving into our space, Commvault is very interesting. They're, they're, a big, they're a big player. They have created a SaaS-based service that we compete with, uh, which is called Metallic, which I do think is the most ironic name for a SaaS-based service. But you know, like it's like named after a piece of hardware when it's not hardware, but whatever. I just find that funny. Uh, Veeam, we run into Veeam a lot, right? And that's mainly because they are everywhere. They have, it's like 500,000 customers or something like that. 
they're, so they're they pretty have, pervasive. They have, yeah. yeah, they are very pervasive. Uh, so we run into Veeam a lot. The company that's probably the, the 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 only company that's like us in that they they went they programmed for the cloud. They're in the cloud. They are only SaaS based. That would be Clumio, right? But they are really still just getting started. Um, uh, they are a SaaS based data protection company, but right now they seem to be only focused on backing up AWS. Um, and I, I think they tried, you know, I don't want, you know, this is my opinion. It looks like they might have tried to boil the ocean in the beginning and they backed off on some of the workloads that they were protecting and said, you know what, we're not going to do all of this all at once. We're going to, we're going to focus right on uh, 365, right? Or, or I'm sorry, AWS. They also do 365. But, How has Dell's investment in Druva changed the product market, product development, or product landscape that you guys have put together? How, how has what investment? Dell. How has their investment in Druva changed your culture or your product market? You know, we, I mean, we are we are a typical startup, right? We have had multiple rounds of investment over time. Uh, and it, I, I don't think there, there was one pivot very early, which was we used, we were not a SaaS based solution. We were an on-prem hardware solution. That was many years ago. We made that pivot to the cloud, something like eight years ago, maybe, uh, once we made that, that pivot, um, really the only changes over time have been the addition of a of, of additional workloads, things like 365, things like Kubernetes and what we do there. So there haven't been any fundamental, like uh, massive shifts of how we do things. It's just, oh, we now protect, uh, you know, the hypervisor from, you know, the Acronis hypervisor, AHV from Nutanix. Um, but we don't, um, we haven't had any massive, you know, Stuff like that. Not to nitpick, but it's Acropolis. What did I say? Acronis. Oh, <laughs> Acronis is another, <laughs> Which is a competitor. That's another competitor. That's funny. Yeah. Acropolis <laughs> hypervisor. Thank you. AHV. Um, yeah. Which at this point, by the way, we just, we just sort of, we sort of soft announced the RAHV support this month. Uh, we're, we're just in a couple of regions. So we're doing a, a soft rollout of that feature. And then I think our full support is next month. Does your product work with the, or plug into the Dell data protection suite? Uh, the, the, did, did I, did, okay. Did we pay you to ask this question? Yeah, the Dell did. data protection yeah, suite is powered um, by Druva. Yeah, if yeah. You could just, we are, we yeah. are the Dell data protection suite. <laughs> Send your checks to <laughs> right. <laughs> well, the, well, box, specifically, well, well, specifically the, you want to hit glass bottles of that Belgian triple yeah. threat, you know. Specifically, <laughs> the the Apex Dell. Uh, I don't the, the official branded name, but their data protection service that they sell under the Apex brand. That service is powered by Druva. Can Druva write to data domain? Uh, no comment on that one. <laughs> We just lost our check, Jeremy. Thank you. There you go, oh, Jeremy. <laughs> there goes another um, sponsor. It's a hard yeah, question. So, so I, I'll just say, I, I will say we are examining that possibility. So, so, so look at this way. We don't require an on-prem piece of storage. The, the whole point of Druva is to plug into, you, you put in a, you know, an OVA into VMware and authenticate to us and boom, magic happens. For a small percentage of our customers, roughly 10%, they want a local copy. Um, the, um, that local copy we provide free of charge. They just need to provide a piece of hardware. We give them an OVA to, to load and it, right, we do that. We are looking into supporting data domain as one of those. Obviously, Dell asked us for that. Um, you know, so, so gentlemen, we are now approaching the end of our hour. Um, I want to see if there's, any final, if there's any final questions, Jeremy, Chris. So how much sugar do you put in your triple in order to get the higher alcohol content? So 
Um, here's what I remember. When I made, it's been a while since I made this. I go, it's been over a year. But, but as I recall, like a typical beer would have like one pound or so of DME, right? Del, uh, I said Del. <laughs> Del <laughs> Just keep going. <laughs> I see you drinking that triple already. That's dried malt extract. Um, the triple had, as I recall, three pounds of DME and two pounds of brown rock candy. So what? it was a ridiculous amount of sugar, right? Because the DME, the main content is sugar, right? Yeah. So it was a ridiculous amount of sugar. And I remember that during the first stage of the brewing process, it was just a crazy amount of, now, of activity. You get the three odd guys back on, and we're going to be talking about the sugar level of our doubles and triples. There uh, you go. <laughs> that was my last question. I, I, we've got another call to make. Jeremy? <laughs> Jeremy, any final thoughts? You know, I mean, I'll have all kinds of thoughts, but uh, direct to cloud, Mac, Windows, Linux, all flavors of Linux, cloud images, You've got uh, native 0365. You back up SharePoint. You back up, yeah, we uh, back one up drive Exchange, as well as part of that. OneDrive, SharePoint Online, uh, all those things. We also back up Teams as well, by the way. Do you have native retention plans for those particular components? Like what do you mean by 365? that? Like um, you only back it up every four hours and you store it. You know. Okay, so the, cu or the how customer. How often are you doing the customer decides how often we back it up. How often? Okay. And that is going to be based on um, RPO. And if I want to, you have DR. So if my machine gets hosed on prem, I can spin it up as an EC2 instance or as an EC3KS yeah, instance in the cloud. The DR piece is really great. So basically, you know, um, and the, the best story is the VMware story. So what we do is we pre restore it. You, just, you do a one time configuration up front. And we then, um, you specify, uh, the, the most common check is after every backup. So you check after every backup, we update your image in the cloud. That image is actually being put into EBS. We then take an EBS snapshot and delete the EBS volume. And the reason for that is cost, right? It's cheaper to store an EBS snapshot. And then and that happens every time you do a you backup or you can do it once a day. It's really up to you because there is a cost for you because this is in your cloud uh, VPC, right? Uh, and then when it comes time to, and you do a one-time uh, configuration of which VMs are included, what types of VMs are associated with which VMs, all of that stuff. You make all of that decision up front. When it's time to do a disaster or either test or declare a disaster, you literally just push one button and it automatically brings all of those snapshots, restores all those snapshots, brings up all your VMs, and we can do a recovery of your entire environment, regardless of the number of VMs in about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and we can support an RPO of one hour because that's, that's as frequent as we can back that up. So it's, it's, so essentially in 15 to 20 minutes, you can get an image running that is less than an hour old. Um, and you could, you know, just say no to ransomware, right? So. Awesome. That's, that's awesome. That is very I can't awesome. Wait till someone has the opposite quote. Just say yes to ransomware. Just say <laughs> the opposite quote. <laughs> so, so listen, Mr. W. Curtis Preston, uh, uh, Doctor Data Backup. Thank you so much for your time. We got a promoter. <laughs> doctor. <laughs> doctor. 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 Listen, thank you so much. We uh, sincerely appreciate it. Very much enjoyed speaking with you. Uh, if you'll hang on for a moment, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, stop.